attended my two previous sessions. I do apologize. You're probably all sick and tired of looking at my face now. Um, but my name's Jamie Coleman, and I'm here today to talk to you about running open cloud native Java at light speed with Open Liberty. So I'm going to get started. You're probably all a bit tired from listening to people for the last two days. So a bit of background, um, and this is quite an important part of technology to me, um, something that I've been looking at for quite a few years. So what does the, we'll, start, we'll start off with the cloud. So what does the cloud actually require? Well, essentially, when we're using the clouds, um, energy pretty much equals money. And it's something developers don't think about a lot these days. So we're told, well, we need to save money on the cloud. We need to make our applications more efficient. But at the end of the day, a lot of the costs that are occurring on the cloud are to do with the resources we're using, with electricity consumption and things like that. So if you think about it a bit more like this, um, talk about a little bit more like climate change, then it means a little bit more to us um, rather than just trying to save our organizations a little bit of money. So this is traditionally how our application runtimes used to work. Um, but there's a problem with this. Essentially, um, the, the amount of time it takes for applications to start up is pretty much completely wasted resources. Um, when our JVMs and our run times go over peak, um, again, it's costing us money, which in turn equals energy. So we really want to have something that looks a little bit more like this. We want our applications to start up very quickly. Um, we want the throughput to be as high as possible very quickly, because again, that initial startup time is pretty much completely wasted energy. So to save energy and money on the cloud, um, what does it demand? So it demands um, a small runtime footprint. We want small deployment sizes. We want a fast starting applications. And when our, res when our applications are idle, we don't want it using extra resources for no reason. So again, going back to kind of energy consumption, um, why should it matter for us as developers? So I'm going to throw some information, some stats out that you may know already. But um, there's over 500,000 data centers worldwide, so half a million data centers. This is including all the small ones that we have in our organizations and things like that. So the area of land they consume is about 6,000 football pitches worth of land, so it's quite a bit of land. And um, I said this earlier today in my workshop, but the amount of energy these data centers are using is approximately one and a half times the whole energy consumption of the whole United Kingdom. So these things we're using in the background, the whole of the world are using, um, that we don't really see, are using massive, massive amounts of energy. So to put a few things into perspective here, um, the information consumed by the internet traffic is enough to fill 7 million DVDs per hour. I should have gone with Blu-rays, but we're going to go with DVDs to make it sound better. Um, and that's enough to scale Mount Everest 95 times with DVDs. So we're using a lot of data and we're using the internet for a lot of things these days. So what are some of the environmental impacts of these data centers? Well, one third of all data currently passes through the clouds. Um, we produce around 1.2 trillion gigabytes of data per year. And in the next years, people, they're predicting that data centers will consume one fifth of all the energy we use on the whole planet. So these things that we're using in the background are consuming massive, massive, massive amounts of energy. So you look at these cities like Las Vegas, Hong Kong, New York, etc., cetera, um, that are lit up crazily. And th that's a tiny, tiny amount of energy compared to what the data centers we're using and the cloud providers are using. So we, we as developers have kind of this responsibility, I would say, to reduce our energy consumption. So the hardware engineers of the world have been doing their part. So if we took a stat from 2010, luckily the hardware engineers have managed to stop our energy consumption going through the roof. Um, but us as engineers, as software developers, it's also our responsibility to help basically reduce that as well. Um, we can't just leave it all to the hardware engineers, can we? So now I'm going to introduce the Open Liberty runtime. Um, you may have heard me talk about it in my previous talk very briefly. Um, if you came to the workshop I did earlier, then you would have used it. Um, but Open Liberty has lots of characteristics that can help reduce costs on the cloud and help reduce energy consumption. So 
if you haven't already heard me talk about Open Liberty, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself. But essentially, this is an open source project that was created by IBM about five years ago with really the intention to make developers' lives easier and to essentially reduce energy consumption on the cloud by having fast startup times. Um, we want it to ramp up very quickly. Again, we don't want to be wasting energy. Um, and that's really what Open Liberty was about. So why Open Liberty? Um, it's just enough runtime, so it's not like you have a runtime that has all these massive features. You add in the functionality and the features you want as you go along. Um, it's got a very low operating cost, and I'll do some comparisons later um, using some of the other runtimes. Um, the, one of the great things I like about Open Liberty is zero migration. So we have a team of about 350, 400 engineers which work on this project. And when we have customers and users that are using old versions, then they're not getting all the latest stuff we're doing. So with Open Liberty, we essentially had this zero migration policy that if you have an application and you want to move to the latest version of Open Liberty, you shouldn't have to change any code whatsoever. Also, Kubernetes optimized. So what does that mean? Well, we do a lot of our testing inside Kubernetes. We tune it. Um, so Open Liberty has a self-tune thread pool. Um, and really, this was one of the first products that IBM had, or projects that we had, that was built for containers. And that was actually my first job at IBM. Um, I started IBM, and I didn't know what Docker was. Um, I think it had only been around about six months. And my manager turned around and said, right, I want you to investigate this Docker thing and see if it's going to be useful in the future. Turned out, yes, containers turned out to be quite popular. So it was quite lucky that um, I started working on this quite early. And part of my job was creating DevOps pipelines, automating the um, production of these containers. And another thing we wanted to go back to, and this has not always been the case throughout history of IBM software, but we really wanted to make it a really good developer experience. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as I go through. So like I mentioned, the Liberty architecture is like the just enough runtime. So um, essentially, it's very small. I think you can get this down. I know there was a talk earlier by Dimitri um, in regards to shrinking down your containers as much as possible. So um, we have got this down to just under 100 meg. But I'm, I'm actually looking at what Dimitri was talking about earlier and see if I can reduce that down even further. But you add in the functionality as you go along rather than having a runtime with everything. Um, in it as, as you get started. So like I mentioned, zero migration is at the heart of this. Um, so I work in an organization called WebSphere, and we have WebSphere Traditional, which has been around, I think, 26 years now, 27 years. Um, the only problem, there was a few problems with WebSphere Traditional, especially in today's world, is it's very big. It's quite a few gigabytes in size. Um, developers don't really like it because it can take five to 10 minutes to start up and very complicated. So you really need a sysadmin to kind of control and uh, basically administer um, traditional WebSphere. Whereas, and the problem is, we have customers that are on versions that are 15 years old, 20 years old. Um, and the reason for that is they just can't afford the cost of moving their applications up to the latest version because the amount of cost and testing, et cetera, that is involved. And for us, that's annoying because we're innovating, we're creating new versions, et cetera, and all our customers are stuck on 15-year-old versions. So again, back with Open Liberty, we wanted zero migration at the forefront of this so you can move to the latest version and your code should never, ever break. Um, so this is a spectrum of architecture styles. Um, this second one is macro services. I call it macro services. And what I consider, this is not a distributed monolith. Um, a distributed monolith, I would say, is more of a well-architected monolith. Um, a macro service is what I kind of see people get to when they try and break apart a monolith and they realize some of their services are so highly coupled, breaking them apart means they'd have to re-architect the whole application and rewrite all the code. So I see a lot of people getting to macro services because they try and break apart their monolith and then they go, okay, we can't break these services apart, so we're going to keep them essentially as larger services, not microservices, but slightly larger services, but it still allows us to scale up and down those services. 
Then you move down to things like microservices, and of course, that allows us a lot more scaling. And then you go down to functions of a service. And functions of a service is where things like um, GraalVM and Quarkus really come into their own, because functions of a service aren't long-running services. They're supposed to come up, do what they need to do, and shut down. Whereas microservices, macroservices are supposed to be a lot more long-running, so they might run for days, they could run for weeks. And then you have your monoliths, of course, um, which technically should be running for ever. So, so this is kind of where WebSphere uh, Open Liberty fits in. Um, again, I mentioned traditional WebSphere, which is great for monoliths. You can use it for macro services, but again, I wouldn't pick up traditional WebSphere if I was creating that new stuff. But Open Liberty fits in this kind of bubble where it has all the functionality of traditional WebSphere. Um, but then it also works really, really well with microservices. I, again, I wouldn't use it as a function as a service because um, Open Liberty is meant for you know running for longer than an hour, long, longer than 10 minutes. Um, and again, if I was going to use function as a service, I'd probably use Quarkus. Um, but it fits in this middle ground quite well, so it can go from a monolith, macroservice, down to kind of microservice architecture. So building with Open Liberty, um, it's obviously got support for Maven and Gradle. We have some great plugins for Maven and Gradle, which allow you to do lots of things. Um, I'll mention dev mode later. Um, and we're also creating new functionality in regards to being able to auto-generate features. So then you would remove any need to configure your runtime whatsoever. It'd look at your code, basically figure out what features it needs, and then put those into your configuration for you. So I mentioned dev mode. So we really wanted to create some functionality and features that would help developers. And dev mode does that. So dev mode essentially allows you to um, start your runtime and then not have to worry about restarting it every time you make a code change, a configuration change, and a test change. So that allows you to essentially um, make some test changes. Your runtime will figure that out. You go back to your terminal, hit enter, and then it will run through your testing cycle. And it does it in less than a second. So you as a developer won't be able to, you as a developer can get back to your application quick, uh, quicker than Open Liberty will be pick those changes. Uh, Longer than it's Open Liberty will pick those changes up. So it helps you as a developer focus on your code rather than having to care about the runtime or where your code's running. So we created this thing called the Liberty Starter. And this is to help you get up and start, get started very, very quickly. And I'm going to take you through that in a, uh, hopefully a demo at the end of this talk. But again, you can select your Java SE version. I think we have up to 17 on here. Um, select your Maven version, select your microprofile version, um, and then really just get started. And it'll generate all the packages you need very, very quickly. So there's lots of different tools for um, Open Liberty. We've tried to make them as simple as possible because we don't want, again, we're trying to remove the aspects of the runtime from developers. So we wanted to make the tools very, very simple to get started with. And all these tools work in containers as well. So you can start up a container with Open Liberty in and use the tools that are in um, IntelliJ and Eclipse and um, VS Code without having to um, worry about the container side of stuff. It'll just, the plugin will take care of all of that for you. And again, back to developer experience, this is kind of at the heart of what we try to do. So we try to we support all the main IDEs. Um, in regards to repositories, you can get stuff from Maven Central, Docker Hub, um, the IBM Container Registry. Uh, we have a partnership with Microsoft. So if you go to Azure, you can go to their catalog. You can click Open Liberty. And then what it will do is it will spin up a Kubernetes cluster for you, sort out all the networking side of things, and then you basically have your cluster ready to go. Um, again, using the normal build tools, Maven and Gradle. We do actually support Ant. I took it off this list because um, I don't know of anyone that's using it anymore. But then I did get asked a question the other day, do you support Ant? And I said, yes, I'm surprised you're still using that. But yeah, we do support Ant, so it's all good. Um, we support the main APIs. And we've generally been one of the first to certify in these APIs um, quite early compared to a lot of other people. And trust me, it takes a, about 350 developers to go through these APIs and certify them and get them running on this runtime. Um, but we also support Spring Boot. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the benefits of using Open Liberty with Spring Boot rather than Tomcat. So a lot of you, when you use Spring Boot, use Tomcat under the covers. Um, but you can switch that out very, very simply, especially if you're using containers. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the uh, performance benefits of that later. 
So microshared testing and test containers, that was what my first talk was about in this conference. Um, and that basically, we have support for that, which enables you as developers to kind of bridge the gap between production and your, um, your development uh, environments to get it as close together as possible. So basically, when you're handing off your code or your application, you're checking it in, and it's going through your DevOps pipeline, hopefully you won't have as many problems as you would um, if you were just you know, running tests locally. And then also, it also helps with things like databases. So you can pull databases down, you can pull all the, the different parts of your um, application down and do integration testing just to make sure um, everything's working. And it's not just me that says this. You can have a look around the internet. There's lots of people that are using Open Liberty these days. Um, and I'm quite glad I'm talking to you all here, because when I asked earlier if you had heard about Open Liberty, um, I didn't see any hands, which means I'm in the right place. And then hopefully you're going to go away from this conference learning something about Open Liberty. So now I'm going to talk a little bit and compare some of the different runtimes against Open Liberty. Um, we have been working really, really hard to make this uh, the best performing runtime that is out there. Um, so this is using um, uh, Java E or Jakarta E, um, and basically we've done a load of benchmark tests here. So the first one is um, the first response with Open Liberty, and again, lower is better. So if we compare it to Wildfly, JBoss, or Pyara, you can see Open Liberty is starting nearly, um, the first response is coming in nearly double, um, half the time. Um, if I compare memory footprint, we're at least half compared to Wildfly, JBoss, and Pyara. And if we look at throughput, um, we are much, much higher. And throughput matters a lot because we're renting resources. And if we have higher throughput in our microservices, we need less microservices, which means we need to pay less money on the cloud. And again, back to the, the energy thing, we're saving more and more energy. So this is with Jakarta EE. Um, Jakarta EE is what Java EE used to be. Um, this was donated to the Eclipse Foundation by Oracle. And we've done some more benchmark tests with this. So as you can see, um, we've basically, as we've gone from Java EE to Jakarta EE, we've also improved our performance as we've gone along. Um, this is using MicroProfile. Um, I'll introduce MicroProfile very quickly. It's an enterprise Java specification for microservices. Um, I think a lot of the different industries, like Microsoft, IBM, Red Hat, we all kind of sat there scratching our heads as to why there isn't an open source specification for enterprise Java um, for microservices. So all these companies kind of came together to build MicroProfile. Um, it's now on its 5.0 release, um, completely open source. And the amazing thing is it's vendor neutral. So if you're with a vendor and they're charging you too much money or they're not giving you the support you want, you can just take your application and put it in a different vendor and uh, without making any code changes. So that's the great thing about MicroProfile. You can just lift your application to a different vendor. Um, so no more of the days where they hold you ransom because you've built all your applications using one vendor. I can literally just take my application and then move it somewhere else. So this is Open Liberty performance with Spring Boot. And again, I'm comparing Open Liberty with Tomcat. Um, it's very, very easy to switch out Tomcat to use Open Liberty. So if I compare here, um, first response time again, um, about 25% um, higher with Tomcat, which is um, not a massive amount of difference, but it is something that we need to consider. Um, the throughput is something you really need to consider here again. Because with throughput, if I've got double the throughput with this runtime, I need generally half the microservices. So um, I mean, let's put hands up. How many people are using Spring? Spring, yeah, see, most of you. So if you're, you say you've got 10 microservices all running with Spring and Tomcat, you, if you switch to Open Liberty, you might be able to reduce that down to five or six. And again, saving you more money on the clouds um, and hopefully more energy. Um, same with things like memory footprint. As you can see, Open Liberty's got a much lower memory footprint compared to using Tomcat. And um, it's also got a lot, lot lower memory footprint during loads. Now, we run these tests probably about every three months, I would say. Um, I think these are the latest charts, so I think I got these a few, a few days ago. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to run your own performance benchmark tests. I've had people come up to me doubting these tests. They've run it while I've been in the conference, and they've come back to me and said, no, no, you, I did get similar um, performance metrics back. So I'm not lying. You can run these things yourself and test them. So what kind of new innovations are coming around, um, around to make 
full-blown Java, more faster, more cloud native. So again, OpenJ9 um, is the JVM. I know my colleague Richard talked about this in an earlier session yesterday. Um, so I'm going to go over it very, very quickly. But this was IBM's JVM, which they open sourced, I think it was about five, six years ago. And we have cha we changed the characteristics a lot to be more cloud native. Now, the problem is with JVMs, when you change one characteristic, it can have detrimental effects on other characteristics. So getting that balance is quite difficult. Um, but with OpenJ9, you, generally, you can make the deployment size quite small. Um, again, it's good for um, computing resources, so it tries to reduce uh, memory footprint as much as possible. And it has quite a fast startup. Um, but a fast startup, so Open Liberty with OpenJ9 can start up in around one second. But people demand even faster than that these days. Now, one second doesn't sound like a lot, and most people will be happy with one second. But we want to get that down even more. So we are chasing different technologies to try and do that. Um, so I'm going to very quickly talk about the differences between, say, GraalVM using a native image and using a full-blown Java stack. So there are positives and negatives of using each of these. And it really, really does depend on what you're trying to build and the application you're trying to build. Um, so GraalVM obviously has some amazing, amazing positives. So you can start up in 50 milliseconds. Um, it has very, very small f um, footprint on startup, so about 30 megabytes. Uh, it has, again, lots and lots of amazing benefits. But then if you start looking at the negatives, this might not work for everybody's kind of situation. So it only runs a subset of existing Java workloads. Um, it's not designed for intense, long-running applications. It can take a long time to um, uh, basically build the native image. So if you don't care about that, OK, GraalVM is, might be a good thing. But if you care about how long your build time is, GraalVM may have some of the negatives. So has anyone heard of this technology? I call it Cryo. I see one hand, two hand, three, four. OK. So this is an amazing technology um, that's not only as at Open Liberty and at IBM. Um, lots of our companies have started looking at this. So it stands for Checkpoint and Restore in User Space. So what does this do? So this is called Liberty Instant On. That's what we're calling it. And what it allows you to do is go through your builds, um, get your JVM to reach its snapshot point. Um, and then essentially what we do is take a snapshot. And then from that snapshot, we can then start up our application and our runtime very, very, very quickly. Um, and I'm talking, so the bigger your application, the more benefit you're going to get out of this. Um, I've used this and got my application to start up in about 0.1, 0.2 milliseconds. Um, you can get that down even lower. And this, we're also trying to get this working with um, Spring Boot. And we have got it working with Spring Boot. We're just trying to figure out some of the little niggly bits. Um, but this is something we've been working on. And I think this could really help take full-blown Java into this kind of cloud-native world where it will instantly turn on and have some of the benefits of using like native um, images. Um, so it's, like I said, it's capable of reducing startup time dramatically. Um, so imagine we're starting up here, Liberty Baseline, about 1.4 seconds. Here we've got it down to 0.12. So it really, really does help us get started very, very quickly. And like I mentioned, the bigger your application, the more benefits you get out of this. So if you start using this way with monoliths, um, that's where you'll get massive amount of benefits. But you still get all the benefits using microservices as well. Um, again, this is a prototype. We are working on it. There are other people working on similar technologies. Um, I think part of the Eclipse Foundation is also working on this. But this will essentially, like I told you, take your full-blown Java JVM and your runtimes and your microservices into this even more cloud-native world where we can start stuff up very, very, very quickly. So going back to the different application APIs, like I mentioned, we were first to certify for a lot of these different things. Um, remember WebSphere 8.5 in 2012. Um, we were the first to commercially certify for Java EE7, um, first to certify for Java EE8, first to certify for Jakarta EE8, um, the first to deliver MicroProfile 1, 1 1.4, 2, et cetera, et cetera. And it does take a lot of energy and a lot of people to do this, but um, that's what we've tried to achieve. We want to be the runtime for these kind of specifications. So Jakarta E has lots and lots of different, um, different specs you can use. And now it's handed over to the Eclipse Foundation. They're trying to very 
rapidly um, iterate on these and, and improve them as quick as possible. Um, so it's turned into a lot more agile organization. Um, so uh, that now they're trying to do releases as quick as possible. And again, it's not governed by one organization. It's governed by the community, which helps a lot trying to basically make new releases as quick as possible. So again, I mentioned MicroProfile very, very briefly. Um, so MicroProfile has some amazing specifications. Some of them are shared with Jakarta EE. But there's also these, um, the ones that are highlighted in yellow here. So these aren't part of the MicroProfile spec, but they work amazingly well. Um, maybe they will become part of it eventually, I don't know. Um, but GraphQL, reactive messaging, um, allows you to basically use reactive architecture with these specifications. Um, so like I mentioned with Spring Boot, it's very, very simple to use Spring Boot with Open Liberty. Um, just very simple to add it to your feature manager um, inside your um, configuration file, which is a bit of XML. And it's very quickly to yeah, essentially switch over Tomcat and get the benefits um, of using Open Liberty with Spring Boot um, very, very simply. Uh, so Liberty configuration, like I mentioned, is just kind of what you need. We wanted to make this as simple as possible. I did mention earlier we're working on something to automatically generate the features for you. Um, so as you can see here, I've just got JAXRS 2.1 enabled. But what we're doing is creating um, some tooling that will essentially scan your code and then go, OK, he needs JAXRS, he needs, um, he needs this, he needs that, and then basically populate this for you. But like I mentioned, it's, it's, we try to make this very, very simple um, to configure. Uh, you have your JVM options file, and, which is basically you just throw into one of the directories and it automatically use it. And you've got your server environment variables, um, which will take precedence inside the um, server XML. Um, and composing config is quite simple. So here, basically, I've got my default endpoints. And the cool thing about this is I can put this configuration into my, um, my Maven file, my POM, and then inject it straight into the configuration. So that means, as a user, um, I don't need to compare, compare, com care about the configuration file. I can put all my configuration in my build file, in my POM file, and it automatically be injected straight into, um, into my application. So externalizing configuration. Um, basically, what we have is this is the variable rev resolution. So you have your server variables at the top, your Java system variables, bootstrap properties, and environment, uh, envi <laughs> environment variables. Um, so basically, they'll take precedence over other, but you can switch this order if you really want. Um, it's very simple to just you change an ordinance property, and you can switch these around. And again, like I mentioned, you can externalize your configuration just to make it a lot easier. Um, with microservices, we shouldn't be putting configuration inside our microservices. We should be externalizing it when possible. Um, so Open Liberty helps do that by using environment variables to inject stuff into your um, applications. And you can use Kubernetes and things like that to do this. So microprofile config, um, like I mentioned, can help with that. You can inject configuration into your application very, very simply. And again, the main thing we want to take away here is do not put configuration into your microservices. Always externalize it. And you can do this, again, using config maps with Kubernetes, which is probably what I'm going to talk about here. So <laughs> Liberty in containers, um, you have your application, your config, you have your runtime, you have the OS level, which is all kind of sitting um, in Docker containers or cont whatever container technology you're using. Um, and again, very simple to get started. All I need to do is say from Open Liberty, that'll pull down the latest Open Liberty image, and then I just add in my WAR file, and that's it. That's it. It'll deploy, it'll run, perfect. Um, Again, containers are great. They're portable, so I can hand them over to other people, um, and they can carry on with the development of things. Um, and you're never really going to find a cloud that doesn't support containers. Um, so you've got things like the IBM Cloud um, Kubernetes service, the Azure Kubernetes service, Google, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you have also can use things for um, the private cloud. So you've got things like Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform. Um, this can then be put on any cloud provider, or you can run it privately. Um, the great thing about this is it kind of creates the same level that you want no matter where you're deploying your application. So I went through deploying a load of different applications to lots of different clouds recently. And you'd think, I'm using Kubernetes. It should be the same no matter where I deploy it. No, that wasn't the case. Um, I found AWS was probably one of the most difficult to kind of get started with. Um, and I think I found Azure to be the easiest, um, just to you know, really get started. But 
we're all using Kubernetes, so why should I have to have different deployment pipelines for different clouds? The whole point of containers and Kubernetes is we all have the same experience. So Red Hat can help with that, and you just kind of put a layer over your clouds so you as developers have the same kind of experience of deploying stuff um, no matter where you're doing it. And then, of course, you've got things like Pivotal Kubernetes Service and Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So it's really up to you where you deploy this. Um, at the heart of Open Liberty, we really essentially wanted to give you the freedom to do whatever you wanted to do. Um, so this is a basically a, a view we've taken. Um, you've got like your fin jars, uh, your fin wall, or your fat jar. Now, the problem is with a fat jar that every time you make an update, it has to update this big layer, which is your application layer. Whereas when you use a fin war, for example, um, you can basically just update the application layer and not have to keep worrying about updating your app server. And this helps with build time quite a lot. It means you can basically lower your builds quite a bit because you don't have to keep updating the runtime side of things. Um, there's lots of different repositories to get these images. Um, we do always support the latest Java, so I haven't updated this, but um, we do support Java 17 and things like that. Um, it usually comes when a new version of Java comes out. We try and basically certify and get um, be fully uh, supported within a few months. Um, but generally, when a new version of Java comes out, nobody uses that in production straight away anyway. Um, but there's, again, there's lots of different places you can pull these images down um, just for your convenience. Uh, the good thing about the IBM Container Registry is it doesn't have a pull limit, which Docker have imposed on us all. Um, so you can use it for your builds and testing and pull um, Open Liberty down as many times as you want, as opposed to Docker, where it has a pull limit. You have to log in and do lots of other stuff. So um, that's why we took the decision to use our own registry, Container Registry, rather than continue to use Docker Hub. Now, we do have Docker Hub. That's fine. Um, but again, you've got to realize it has pull limits and things nowadays. So um, we thought we'd replicate it and put it in different places. Um, so, yeah, like I mentioned, they're all available on the IBM Container Registry. Um, you don't need any authentication to pull this stuff down, um, and there's no rate limits. So you can pull it down as many times as you want. Um, we notice this um, in the learning environment I've been using in my workshop that, say, if we have 30 people in the workshop, well, all of a sudden, Docker's go on the same IP address, Docker's going to go, well, no, you can't keep pulling that down. So I had to very quickly go and change um, where it's pulling it down on the registry just to avoid this problem. And again, this is why we decided to do this. So anyone know what? Anyone used operators before? Hands up, anybody? Operators? No, OK. So operators are amazing. They basically make our lives a lot easier. Um, I presume you've all had the pains of going through YAML, deploying your stuff to Kubernetes, and having to configure every little thing. Um, but what an operator does, it simplifies the operations on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, so OpenLiberty has, I think it's a level five operator, which is the highest level of operator. And essentially, it helps you create concise deployments. Um, and it allows you to gather things like dumps and traces very, very easy. It allows you to do service binding, security, certificate management, observability, um, and abstracts away some of that horrible configuration we have to do every time we deploy to um, Kubernetes. Now, it's not just Open Liberty that has operators, lots and lots of other uh, software and applications and runtimes all use this. So if you haven't checked out operators before, do check it out. Um, I think there's a website called Operator Hub, which where they're all stored. Um, and you can very, very quickly install them into your Kubernetes um, orchestrator and get started um, basically deploying your applications. And again, no one really likes YAML. So this helps simply. It is YAML, but it's a lot simpler um, and it makes your life a lot, lot easier. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes are integrated with Open Liberty. Um, so you've got things like metrics and monitoring we can get out of it. Um, Kubernetes has liveliness, readiness, and startup probes. So these all work with Open Liberty and the microprofile. And um, it allows you to request uh, tracing and telemetry. And again, this is all being done with um, the operator. And then you can pipe that stuff into Grafana and uh, Kubana basically um, to view what you need. So I talked a little bit about testing in containers earlier. So this is a very, very short overview. Um, but it allows you to essentially do integration testing, spin up containers on your local machine, and basically do as much integration testing as you can. So when you hand your, um, your code over to your DevOps engineers, the hope is that um, it won't fail, or it's going to fail less frequently. 
Um, and test containers, again, it essentially works by um, you build your containers, it'll pull down stuff from a registry like your database and all your other applications. So if you've got lots of teams working on individual microservices, they will then eventually build those microservices and put them somewhere in a registry. So you as a developer of your microservice can just pull down all your other team's microservices, test it all together in an integration test, and then throw it all away afterwards. Then, you, okay, all my tests have passed, I can hand it over to my DevOps engineers, and then, fingers crossed, we can get it into production a lot, lot quicker. So just to finish up before I get to, I'm gonna show you a little bit about how you can get started with this. But again, support licensing. Um, it's very easy to switch to get support for Open Liberty. Now, Open Liberty, like I said, is completely free to use. Um, but if you do need support for it, that's where IBM comes in. Uh, we have these. If you do but get support, we have these amazing, amazing tools. Um, Transformation Advisor. What it does is goes through your monoliths and looks at how it essentially can be converted into. Basically, take your old applications, so stuff running on, say, traditional WebSphere or JBoss, and show you how you can very, very quickly um, get them running with Open Liberty. It all, Mono to Micro is an amazing thing we've been working on for the last two years. Um, it's got an amazing graphical interface, and what it does is it will scan through your monolith. It will look at all the points where different methods and classes talk to one another. It will automatically break apart your monolith into little pieces and then test all those parts to see if it all works. And then what it will do is you can go into the graphical user interface, you can see all those connections happening, and it will even generate code for you to get started so you can actually break your monolith into little pieces. Um, and that is something that is included when you get licensing for Open Liberty. So how to get started with this? Um, if you came to my workshop earlier, you would have seen this environment. Um, but what we've been working on for the last uh, few months is essentially creating a deep dive on Open Liberty using this environment so you can get started very, very quickly. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you just what this includes. And then hopefully, if you are interested, you can get started very quickly. So this is the environment um, ID on the left, instructions on the right. And what this will take you through is pretty much start to finish of Open Liberty. So, It'll take you through what you'll learn, getting started, getting started with REST, documenting your APIs, configuring your microservice, persisting data, securing your RESTful APIs, um, how you consume those secured RESTful, uh, RESTful APIs, adding health checks, providing metrics, building the container, then testing it with test containers, deploying it to Kubernetes, and then a bit of information about support licensing. Um, and you basically start off using, uh, let me see if I can find it, Oh, sorry. Da -da -da. There we go. OK, this is going to be weird, because now I've got to use that screen, uh, which is not helpful. All right, so yeah, basically, it'll take you through what you learn. So you can go to the table of contents here. So these are all the different things you can use. Um, this workshop, this module takes about two hours, so you can get started with it. This is kind of the architecture of the application. And this is then going to use, I think it's on step three, this is going to use the Open Liberty starter to get started. Now, because this is in a, con a containerized environment, um, obviously, we, this will generate as a zip file to get started with. Um, so like I said, we can use um, 17, if I can actually select it. And then this will generate a zip file for you, which you can get started very easily. Um, because we're in a containerized learning environment, um, I can't get that zip into that environment um, that simply. Oh, sorry, everybody. Um, so what you can do is basically in the learning environment, well, I can just curl the endpoint. Um, if I show you here, all I'm doing there is curling the endpoint, essentially downloading the zip straight into this environment, um, just to a, basically with the, um, the preferences I've selected in uh, the starter. So if you're doing this locally, it'll generate the zip for you and get started. But um, in this environment, essentially, yeah, all I'm doing is using a curl command to replicate what the selections I'll be making elsewhere. Um, you can run all this stuff locally, so we have this all on our Open Liberty website. Um, again, you'll have to install the prerequisites that are required, but I think mostly all you'd need is containers. You might need to install Kubernetes. Um, I know some of us can't use Docker these days, so um, yeah, you can use different uh, Docker and container technology, sorry. Um, so this does work with Rancher and Podman and things like that. So I'm just going to wrap up very quickly, because um, again, this is my third session of this conference. You're probably all sick and tired of listening to me and hearing me. Um, 
But again, you can get started very, very quickly. We have lots of different guides. You can see the little button, the little uh, thing in each guide that says running clouds. This will then take you to our learning environment. Um, all you need is an up-to-date browser. And um, we have support lots of different technologies. And we are neutral in regards to a lot of things. We've put that at the heart of this. Um, the reason we open sourced this, I mean, we had to fight with IBM, the IBM sales team for two years before they would allow this to happen because they were scratching their heads like, well, how are you going to make any money? Um, but we as engineers don't care so much about that. So we wanted it open source and the community likes open source. So we eventually got it done. Um, but you can check out a lot of stuff on there. Um, and I just wanted to say a great thank you for having me here. Again, this is my first time in Bulgaria. Um, it's my first time at J Prime. I hope you've all enjoyed the conference. And yeah, thank you. I'm not going to take another picture because the room was full, more full in my last session, so I'll use that one. Yes, I have a question. question. Uh, so I want to ask in what way is Open Liberty better or uh, co uh, compared to Quarkus? To Quarkus. So, yeah, like I mentioned, Quarkus has its own set of abilities that it's really suited for. Um, Quarkus, like I mentioned, is amazing as a function as a service. So it starts up very, very quickly. And when we're using function as a service, we want to start up, complete our task, and shut down very, very quickly. So in regards to scaling, Quarkus is absolutely amazing. Um, so that is really what Quarkus is designed for. If I'm trying to give you differences between the two, um, it might be difficult because I don't know if you know, um, IBM bought Red Hat, so it's very difficult for me to say I, uh, Open Liberty is better than um, uh, Quarkus in some aspects, but it really, it really depends on what you're trying to do. So, for example, if you're using um, a multitude of different things like monoliths, say what I call macroservices and microservices, I wouldn't dare try and run a monolith on Quarkus. Like, I just would never try it. It's not built for monoliths. That's not what Quarkus is about. So Open Liberty is kind of a runtime that scopes lots of different things, whereas Quarkus I would only really use for microservices and function as a service. Now, again, there's lots of different things. So Quarkus is built for native code, so it uses the Graal VM and things like that. And again, it really depends on what you're trying to do with your project. Um, so if I go back to that slide that has the differences between the two, um, this is what you really need to take into consideration and come to your own conclusion about, uh, yeah, come to your own conclusion about what you're trying to achieve with your application, and then you make a decision on what runtime you want to use. So hopefully that kind of answered your question. And again, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much about the differences between the two because, yeah, they're both kind of part of the, the same company. <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you. No worries. Any other questions, feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, I'm actually in Bulgaria until tomorrow afternoon. Technically, I'm supposed to be flying out to Istanbul to another conference, but um, that's not happening. So I'm doing that talk from my, <laughs> uh, my hotel room. But yeah, if anyone's got any other questions, do feel free to just come and find me. I'll be around um, probably downstairs with the conference organizers and things like that. Um, have you all enjoyed J Prime? Has it been good? Has it been a good experience? I suppose it's the first time you've all seen each other in like, well, yeah, been to an in-person conference in about two years. Um, what I've noticed about this conference is you're all quite young. <laughs> I mean, I go to a lot of tech conferences and uh, the average age is probably over 40. So it's quite cool to see so many young people at a conference. Um, it must mean your companies like you because they're sending you here to, uh, to uh, join the conference. So yeah. So yeah, thanks everybody. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference.